So oh, um, what I'll focus on, well, I hope my voice, I've been really hoarse today. I hope my voice holds up. I think that'll be a good thing. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about a, a course I taught this last semester, the spring of 2011, Space Mission Design course, and how I incorporated um, some uh, hands-on high-altitude ballooning projects into that course. Um, I'll provide a, a bit of a background uh, introduction, um, talk just a little bit about the Department of Space Studies at the University of North Dakota, uh, a little bit of an introduction about the course, uh, talk a little bit about some background material, provide you with a little context um, for especially one of these uh, high altitude ballooning team projects uh, that were incorporated into the course, uh, the imaging payload. I'll talk about the other team projects uh, that were utilized uh, for this course. Um, and then con conclude with some final thoughts, uh, uh, feedback I got from the students and their evaluations, and so forth. Excuse me. Um, so uh, the University of North Dakota is in Grand Forks, North Dakota, which is uh, about a, uh, 90 miles uh, south of the Canadian border on the eastern edge of the state, if you don't know where that is. Um, and uh, we're in the John D. Odegaard School of Aerospace Sciences. What you see here is Clifford Hall, and the Space Studies Department is on the top floor of uh, Clifford Hall. Uh, the Space Studies uh, program uh, was established in 1987. Um, we provide um, an interdisciplinary program. Um, so we cover a lot of ground um, within space. Uh, our student body um, is composed of both on-campus and distance students. We're primarily an on-campus, um, or I should say a, a master's degree program. We do have an undergraduate uh, minor for on-campus students, um, but our master's degree program um, is our primary focus. Uh, we have 15 to 20 dis campus students, um, and most of our students are out there in the military and the industry and so forth. Uh, we have roughly 75 uh, distance students in our program, um, and roughly 650 um, alumni, uh, uh, people that have graduated from our program. As I mentioned, we're interdisciplinary in nature, um, so we try to integrate, integrate the various disciplines um, uh, have to do with space, physical life sciences, engineering, um, uh, policy, law, business, management, um, and also uh, space history. So just a little bit about our uh, program. Uh, the uh, course I taught this last spring, uh, Space Studies 405, uh, Space Mission Design, had um, uh, the following objective. Um, basically to introduce students uh, to the uh, space mission analysis uh, design process, um, talk about payload sensors, subsystems, um, interaction of the major uh, mission elements. What I'm going to focus on today, though, um, are the team projects uh, that I incorporated into this course. Uh, it's a three-credit course, um, uh, roughly one-third of the student effort, uh, one credit's worth of work was devoted towards uh, these team projects by each student. Um, and I did this during the second half of the semester. I started these uh, engineering design teams during the second half of the semester, um, primarily because, um, as you saw, we're an interdisciplinary program. Um, we take um, undergraduates from a wide variety of uh, disciplines. Um, uh, I had a journalism major in my Space Studies 405 course, and she did quite well, actually. Um, but it takes some time uh, to bring um, uh, some students up to speed on engineering principles and so forth. So um, students in this course were both on campus and distance students, undergraduate and graduate students, and some of them did have technical back backgrounds, um, science and engineering, um, in addition to many that had non-technical backgrounds. So this 400 level course uh, can be taken for graduate credit. There is a little more expectation um, on those students for the students uh, that do take it for graduate credit, and I'll talk about that in uh, just a bit. So um, I'm a tenure track professor. I taught this course just one other time, and I decided to modify the, the course content recently, and that, uh, was actually fun that effort was funded by North Dakota Space Grant. Um, and I wanted to include more experiential learning, more hands-on projects uh, into this course. Now, that's somewhat problematic for distance students. Um, uh, they can't get their hands on hardware so easily, but uh, for campus students, um, certainly um, that was easy to do. 
Um, and I decided to use um, near space missions, high altitude ballooning uh, missions, um, to act as a, sort of a prototype uh, for uh, spacecraft missions. And of course, as you, as you probably know, a lot of the same design considerations go into building a um, uh, near space uh, spacecraft as would go into an actual spacecraft. Um, the textbooks I used uh, for the course content um, were SMAD, Space Mission Analysis and Design. Many of you are probably familiar with that. Um, also a book by Jerry John Sellers, um, Understanding Space and Introduction to Astronomics, Astronautics. Um, uh, the material in the second is a little easier to assimilate um, for students, especially those with a non-technical background. Um, so that's a brief introduction. Um, I wanted to pro provide a bit of a backdrop uh, for this talk by talking about uh, some of the student-driven aerospace engineering projects at the University of North Dakota. Um, there are several prominent ones. Um, uh, one of them in the Space Studies Department, Pablo de Leon, um, uh, has a, a spacesuit development um, uh, program going on. Um, there's also a strong UAS program at the University of North Dakota. Actually, um, uh, what brought me back to that area, I grew up in uh, this region, um, moved away for a while, and then uh, came back, and I was uh, working in, as a postdoc in the electrical engineering department um, on uh, UAS payloads. Um, and uh, one of these that I'll focus on uh, provided the motivation uh, for um, one of these high-altitude balloon payloads in this space mission design course, an imaging payload. But I'll get to that in a moment. Um, some of the other um, student-driven engineering projects that I've uh, mentored are high-altitude ballooning payloads, um, both those flown on meteorological payload, uh, balloons and also um, HASP. Um, sounding rocket payload, one year uh, John Nordley, Tim Young, and I um, mentored a team of students uh, that were involved in the ROCKSAP program, so we um, designed, built, and flew um, a sounding rocket payload. Um, I was recently funded uh, to do some small spacecraft development, um, and I'll uh, talk about that in a bit. Um, as I mentioned, most of our students are distance students, so they're geographically dispersed. Um, and what I've been using heavily um, for these students in these type of design projects is uh, Adobe Connect Pro, which of course we used um, for the first speaker this afternoon, um, Bill Brown. Um, so I've used that uh, to good effect. Um, a little bit about our local high-altitude balloon uh, program. Um, the UND HAB project um, at its first launch in 1998. Uh, since that time, we've uh, launched roughly uh, 40 balloons. Uh, most of those were in uh, the early uh, period, roughly 1998 to 2003. There was a lot of activity, um, and then that waned. Um, but uh, John Norley, who was um, one of two people that started this uh, project along with John Graham and I have been resurrecting uh, this program as of late. Um, I won't talk a whole lot about that uh, project in particular because John will cover that uh, tomorrow. Um, another high altitude ballooning uh, effort at the University of North Dakota, you heard a little bit about that um, from Greg this morning and I want to thank Greg and Michael um, and everybody that's associated with HASP. It's a wonderful, wonderful program um, providing students with uh, uh, flight opportunities on zero pressure balloons. Uh, so uh, we first became involved uh, in 2008, um, and he, uh, Greg actually showed this very same plot earlier today. That was the, uh, we uh, um, flew an ozone sensor, and uh, as you see there, the ozone profile uh, that we acquired in our payload is on the left-hand side. Uh, we've had a wonderful collaborative relationship um, with uh, Nermal Patel. Um, at the University of North Florida um, through this project. Um, one, so I'm a, I, I know there's a trend uh, to incorporate more research into teaching and so forth, and I'm a big believer in that. Um, one way I've been uh, doing that is uh, through uh, this project, uh, dubbed Artemis, the Airborne Real-Time Embedded Mosaicing Imaging System. When I was a postdoc in electrical engineering, um, I was involved in this effort, um, which was uh, spearheaded, the research for this was spearheaded by the late uh, Richard Schultz at the University of North Dakota, but it's a collaborative effort between the EE department and space studies, 
um, nowadays. Basically what it is, um, is it's an imaging system that's been developed uh, for unmanned aircraft systems, UAS. Um, and uh, I would like to further develop that uh, to fly it on a balloon-borne and possibly in the future a space-borne uh, platform. The way this works um, is uh, one takes multiple images, could be video, could be um, uh, individual still pictures, um, and transforms those individual images into a single image of some region of interest. Here you see multiple images um, that are stitched together at the sub-pixel level into one image of some uh, region of interest. Um, and uh, the way it works is basically um, features that are common to individual frames denoted by these red dots um, uh, are, are first of all identified um, and then the correlation between frames is determined. Uh, you can um, uh, make this process a little more efficient um, if you can estimate the motion of the vehicle um, from, say, GPS and IMU uh, data, and then um, you translate, rotate, basically warp these images uh, so that you form, let's see if this works. Oh. Let's see. Oh, it's not gonna work for me today. Um, so basically this is, at the top is, um, one of these images, um, and then what happens, of course, is multiple images are stitched together, like I say, at the sub-pixel level uh, to form one continuous image. You can also, um, if you have a very capable processor, do things like super resolution, um, where the final image is better resolved than any of the individual images that, that go into um, uh, that final image. Um, but the benefit of this is as follows, basically, um, uh, well, historically, I think I had this on the previous slide. Um, yeah, mosaicing traditionally involves post-processing. So typically, you gather these images, send them to the ground, and then you stitch them together on the ground. Uh, but if you can do this in the air, um, you can save bandwidth, right? Because instead of sending, say, video down to the ground, maybe three megabytes of video, uh, instead you send a, a single image, um, which is you know a couple order of magnitude smaller, one 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 hundredth the size. So you can imagine the obvious, obvious benefits for that. Um, so like I say, that, that kind of provides a backdrop for one of the uh, team projects uh, uh, that I incorporated into the space mission design course. Um, as I mentioned already, we use online conferencing software in the space studies department. Um, we use it for both uh, distance education and also uh, to coordinate uh, the efforts of these um, geographically dispersed um, participants. As you know, it provides, from our demonstration earlier this afternoon, audio, uh, video. Uh, we also have a whiteboard. Um, we can share files, share our screen, and so forth. Um, so it's, it's been very um, helpful for that. Um, this is a screenshot from um, our HASP 2008 uh, project uh, where uh, we did our pre preliminary design review uh, within uh, Adobe Connect Pro. Uh, this is one of the students actually answering a question from our um, uh, collaborator at the University of North Florida. Um, uh, we brought him in uh, to the design review uh, in a virtual sense. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we've uh, been involved in the past in uh, sounding rocket payload development. Uh, through Rocksat, we purchased one half of a payload canister. Uh, we had two partners, um, or two other um, uh, uh, participants uh, that were also, that each bought, purchased a quarter of a canister. So when it came uh, to integration time, um, and it happened that one of them um, had a camera. We were covering half of the optical port with our payload initially. So we gave up a little bit of volume, um, traded uh, some volume with them, um, or I should say space with them. Um, and this, this, uh, this type of software worked out great for, for that uh, piece of the project. So um, back to the course itself, uh, the space mission design course. Um, uh, basically, uh, th uh, the grading was based on examinations, the team project, and uh, participation. So the team project, as I mentioned already, was roughly 
uh, one third of the course. Um, uh, students had a chance to evaluate their peers as, um, uh, as part of uh, the grading process. Also, um, for those, uh, grad those students that took this for graduate credit, um, the requirement for the team component uh, was that those students serve as either the team lead or uh, serve on two teams. So each of these team projects um, culminated um, in one of the following um, steps in a typical engineering design review process, um, either uh, a mission concept review at the end of the semester, preliminary design review, critical design review, flight readiness review, or an operational readiness review. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this was conducted during the second half of the semester. Uh, so there were four deliverables for the students. First of all, um, I had them each submit a team um, biograph or a biographical sketch for themselves. Um, keep in mind, many of these students were distance students, so to get to know one another, um, it's it, get to know their backgrounds, their passions, why they're interested in space and so forth. It's helpful to um, have them uh, write a little bit about themselves and post that on the class website. Um, then a team status report. Basically what I did is each, each of these projects, as you saw with the, um, the Artemis project, um, that was at a certain state of maturity. So I summarized each of these team projects and, um, and then they basically reported back to me, um, echoed back to me. Um, uh, their th where they thought this team project was. And they went through an initial design review um, where basically they outlined um, that step um, uh, that they were going to, in the uh, design process that they were going to um, address during the final design review at the end of the semester. Um, so the, um, like I mentioned, I'll focus on just one of those team projects, the high altitude balloon um, imaging payload. Primary objective there was to acquire video uh, with varying levels of ground resolution from a high altitude balloon uh, to be tested with the Artemis software. Um, this camera, this uh, camcorder was chosen primarily because um, of its uh, optical zoom of 60 times. So uh, what the students did is they, um, first of all, came up with a mission statement, set of mission objectives derived from those mission requirements, constraints, and then there were a number of tasks uh, that they performed, uh, calculations having to do with resolution, some simple thermal modeling, came up with mass, power budgets, mechanical drawings. Um, there was a microcontroller that uh, controlled the servo that uh, adjusted the zoom of the, of the camera. Um, so there was some software development came up with a rudimentary uh, engineering prototype. And then at the very end, uh, they developed a flight model um, that was built, fully tested, passed the flight readiness review, and now awaits a launch. So these are some images of uh, the hardware on the bench, their mechanical drawing showing the layout of all the hardware, and then as they were assembling that um, in the styrofoam box. Um, uh, the very end. Um, there were six projects in total. Um, I talked a little bit about the uh, high altitude balloon imaging payload. There was also a biological payload. Um, and I'll step through these quickly one at a time. <clears throat> in a previous flight, uh, we flew um, uh, a water bottle with a couple of radish plants into the stratosphere. Um, and uh, <laughs> one of my colleagues is a, a life science, space life science expert, so he's interested in uh, low pressure uh, gardening, basically, uh, for a lunar or Mars uh, habitat. So, so he was interested in doing, the, in, uh, doing this experiment. We, um, uh, one of the students, several of the students listed here uh, wanted to take this up and uh, uh, provide a little more controlled environment. Um, uh, providing a little bit of heat for these uh, plants and so forth, so um, they came up with um, a payload that basically reached the CDR phase. Um, I talked about the high altitude imaging payload. There was a high altitude balloon launch and uh, tracking operations team. Um, so they were, um, uh, they learned a bit about uh, that process. Super pressure balloon mission architecture team. Um, uh, basically they came up with a mission concept uh, to fly um, uh, some multi-gas sensors 
I'm on a super pressure balloon satellite ground station team. Uh, we have an internet controlled observatory um, about 10 miles west of the campus. And uh, what we're planning to do is put an AMSAC class ground station out there. Um, so the, there was one team that worked on that, brought it to the PDR state. Then a small satellite mission architecture team um, composed primarily of students. So as, as with the super pressure balloon team, um, like I say, it's um, easier for the students, distance students to work on these paper designs, but obviously more difficult uh, for them to um, work on any hardware. So uh, some of the student feedback got excellent evaluations from the students um, on this course. There are only two questions that really pertained uh, to um, the, uh, the team projects um, um, in the standard uh, student evaluations that are given out by our university. Um, but there are um, plenty of written comments uh, by the students um, that expressed um, how satisfied they were with the, the incorporation of these team projects into this course. Um, so I'll just conclude um, with uh, perhaps the obvious to this crowd, but uh, maybe not to others, that high altitude balloon missions provide practical exposure to the major phases of uh, space uh, mission design. Um, Let's see, what I wanted to get to is, um, I would like to um, collaborate with those, and I, and I see Taylor University is very adept at this, um, assessing, putting numbers to this, um, uh, you know, uh, assessment uh, plan for a course. So I'd like, I'd like to uh, uh, talk to you about that. Um, and also we invite uh, collaborative, collaborative efforts on uh, payload development and uh, perhaps coordinated launches um, in the future. So I want to acknowledge North Dakota Space Grant uh, for funding for this project and any questions. <laughs>